And I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and Mac, but just so that folks know, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat as usual so that Stacy and Mac don't have to. Um, and with that, I will turn it all over to our presenters. So hello, I'm Stacey Krim in Special Collections and University Archives. Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, just a little bit. Um, it's a little um, underwater. Okay, how about now? Yeah, much better. Can you, can you hear me well, everybody? Okay. All right. Um, and hi, everybody. I'm Mac Nelson. I'm in uh, Technical Services. And... Um, We'd like to provide you with a bit of context as we get started. Um, and we want to offer a few words about everyone's favorite off the record backroom or barroom subject, uh, and that is turf wars. That's right. We'll go on the record and admit right up front that turf wars do exist, and not just at some other institution. Uh, long before Stacy and I began our collaboration in support of donor development for UNCG's university libraries, the relationship between our respective departments had sometimes been more than a little strained, not to say wholly toxic. A central reason for this was that departments were deeply, both departments were deeply invested in creating access to the libraries archival and special collections holdings. In itself, this was a good thing, of course, but far too easily, it became problematic because communication about which department should do what and just how or when or by whom a thing should be done was not always clear and agreed upon in advance by both departments. Passions sometimes ran high, with conflict stopping just short of murder on occasion, if the old stories are to be believed. Unwittingly, I helped complicate this situation in 2006, when I was hired to the newly created position of cello music cataloger. On the one hand, this um, position represented a major positive step by library leadership toward much needed support of our marquee special collection. On the other hand, it landed this new cataloger squarely on some pretty scorched turf between technical services and uh, special collections university archives. Uh, this was the case because my position, in addition to assigning me responsibility for extensive item level cataloging, also identified me as the, quote, chief resource person, end quote, for the cello music collection, which meant that I was expected to take an active approach to public services and outreach on behalf of the collection. Uh, I published an article about this in Cataloging and Classification Quarterly back in 2010, in which I detailed my activities as chief resource person leaving aside at that time a uh, description of the laborious process by which my duties were being coordinated with those of special collections uh, and archives. Stacy will provide some context uh, and perspective on this. When I took over responsibilities of the cello music collection in 2010, my quick assessment of the situation was that we had a large growing collection that was struggling in terms of processing because of understaffing in the department. In my first months working with the collection, which in general are very vulnerable periods for archivists because you don't really know what's in the collection or the history of the collection, I was also investigating task processing practices and interdepartmental communication to make improvements and build relationships with Mac and cataloging. I knew that communication was critical. I feel that one of the primary issues leading to conflict in, is poor communication. And I felt that this situation, uh, in this situation, there needed to be greater clarity about what was happening with material both in school and cataloging and why there may be delays so that there was no assumption being made 
um, that would that compounds it can lead to a toxic relationship. In the first meeting with Mac and I had, um, which included our department heads, it felt like a bit of a Cold War meeting. I handed out this workflow chart you're seeing documenting the process of what happens to an r carbon collection before material goes to cataloging. And looking back a decade later, I think this chart really sets the tone in terms of our interdepartmental relationship. I want there to be total transparency about the processes and priorities, sometimes in our case, whether Mac wants it or not. I, I do sometimes give him too much information, I think. Um, I want us to have a relationship in which we can ask questions of each other and constructively critique each other. And framing this relationship is the great affection and enthusiasm Mac have for our archival music collections. We are constantly amazed at the material in the collections and love the people with whom we interact with in the process of reaching out to donors and the community. I can say that the perspective of us being a team has created not only a great environment in which to work, but has benefited our donor outreach and collection building, which is what we're talking about today. Fairly early on after taking over curatorial responsibilities, I wrote a collection development policy for the cello music collection so that we would have firm guidance on assessing our priorities of what we would wanna be looking for in a donor and a collection. In many ways, such an articulated policy is valuable, not only in providing guidance about what should be included in the collection, but also what should be excluded, which is important because shelf space in an archive is always at a premium. Archives are the one space in the library that will see continued growth of collections with no weeding. So we need to be able to regulate how we take in material. Ideally, a collection development policy should be flexible in terms of what gets accepted, but when dealing with potential donors of material, ha having the ability to say, this doesn't fit our collection development policy is a polite way of turning down material. However, such a policy can also bring in donors because you can share the policy on the policy with people in your organization who are doing community outreach and donor development and those people may be able to connect you with potential donors if they know what you're looking for. <clears throat> uh, from the beginning of my time with the libraries, I've taken a proactive approach to outreach primarily on behalf of the cello music collection, but also in support of other archival collections here at UNCG. The key I have found is to persist in cultivating a rich developmental network, inclusive of university libraries and school of music colleagues and extending outward by way of correspondence and meetings in person whenever possible with musicians, vendors, booksellers, antiquarians, independent scholars, philanthropists, and a variety of other artists, patrons, and professionals. There is a lot of footwork to be done. Let me give you ex an example of the value of cultivating such crucial relationships in what I'm calling developmental networks, a term I didn't invent, by the way. Um, here's an example. In 2006, Laszlo Varga, long the New York Symphony's principal cellist under Leonard Bernstein, attended a three-day event at UNCG celebrating the Beaux-Arts trio cellist Bernard Greenhouse's decision to donate his music library to the cello music collection. In collaboration with our music librarian, Sarah Dorsey, and then cello professor, Brooks Whitehouse, I began corresponding with Varga in advance of the celebration and arranged to serve as his escort for the event, which meant I spent four days and most of four nights driving this great artist all over the place and doing my best to keep him out of the trouble he had such a talent for finding. Shortly thereafter, Varga announced that he too would donate his collection to us. So one year later, I again served as his escort for a week long residency at UNCG in preparation for the Varga celebration of 2007. 
In attendance at that event was a colleague of the late Bulgarian cellist, Lubomir Georgiev. And within the next week, I got a call from uh, Georgiev's colleague, um, whom I had not actually met at the event, um, but he had heard me speak. And his telephone call started the process uh, of bringing Georgiev's music library to UNCG, and, which happened in 2008. Now, further to the Bulgarian cello music market, uh, much more recently, Stacy has collaborated with patrons drawn particularly to the Georgiev collection, and the resulting additional donation has made us the go-to repository in this specialized but very important niche. With our development, we were sometimes working directly with musicians and sometimes usually after the musician has died, we will be working with the family. And generally musicians donate collections towards the end of their lives or the end of their careers. So the musician's family frequently will have a role in the drama of negotiation. Whatever the case may be, when you are building relationships with the donor and their family, it's important to be aware that there may be family baggage and conflicts you'll have to navigate through. It can turn into a bit of a soap opera when it comes into dividing an estate. This is why we like to have the donor sign a deed of gift for material as soon as possible or include the collection donation in their will. Sometimes this cannot be done in time and you just have to weather the storm waiting to see how things turn out. From a library standpoint, it is better to be prepared for this than to be blindsided. Try to cultivate at least one advocate in the family who will work with you and keep you informed. Here you see Laszlo Varga, of whom I just spoke on the left, and Bernard Greenhouse to his right. Both are on stage here at UNCG in the School of Music. Further to Stacy's point that we tend to meet our donors toward the end of their careers, we inevitably converse with them about their legacies. Many of them have long enjoyed celebrated status and they know, um, they know better than anyone just how fleeting their fame is likely to be. So we feel their urgency when it comes to preserving their legacies and we strive to be who they need us to be. Returning to Laszlo Varga as an example, uh, this man took great pride in being a maverick arrangement of music. Uh, even the Beethoven violin concerto was not safe in the company of this cellist, who was also known as the lone arranger. And the more criticism Varga heard over the years about his audacious arrangement for cello of this landmark of the violin literature, the Beethoven Violin Concerto, uh, the more vocal he became about the value of multiplying perspectives on this and other masterworks. In conversation with Varga, he made it clear that he wanted the libraries to draw special attention to his manuscript and published arrangements. After we succeeded in this by way of exhibits and oral history interviews, he turned up with three fat envelopes containing his notes toward a memoir and asked, can you do something with this? Varga was thrilled when we recruited a talented graduate student to help complete this project and present Varga with an annotated draft of his memoir. And finally, at what turned out to be the end of his career, Varga asked us to host him one last time in performance at the UNGC, uh, UNCG School of Music. He then proceeded to change the entire program three times in three weeks, putting his accompanist on her ear before calling me to say in his uh, very direct way, and I quote him, it is over, I cannot play. Uh, another example or two, family members when donating after the cellist's death or any music donor, but um, we're speaking of cellists here right now, um, 
these family members often seek reassurance and closure. Uh, Lubomir Georgiev's widow had one wish that she expressed to me, and that was that his legacy be fully preserved, which for her meant no waiting under any circumstances of duplicates or anything else in the collection. Fortunately for us, Lubo, as he was called, uh, was meticulously organized and downright inspiringly tidy in the management of his library. So the weeding was done by him long before we even process, processed his materials. Uh, fi finally, in many cases, family members who have managed uh, donations for their deceased relations need us simply to listen to them periodically. There is one donor with whom I've been speaking at intervals for over a dozen years now. He is a wonderful man still at it and full of big ideas in his mid nineties. And uh, this particular donor keeps me hopping with, the rega with regard to the how of communication. He prefers talking on the telephone after 1 p.m. so long as he is the one who makes the call. Returning calls doesn't much appeal to him anymore. However, if he does return my call, he usually does so to Stacy, whom he politely asks, please, to have Mac ring him after 1 p.m. This donor does send an email now and then, but only to remind me that he doesn't use email any longer. So would I please ring him after 1 p.m.? A few years ago, to my great surprise, I stumbled across him on Facebook and sent him a friend request, which remains unanswered to this day. It turns out that his grandchildren got him on Facebook that one time only. He enjoyed telling Facebook what was on his mind, and that was that, or so he told me shortly thereafter when I rang him after 1 p.m. This issue of communication style is important, and it's easily overlooked, especially in busy times. Stacy and I have different strengths in this regard, and this works to the benefit of our collaboration. With Facebook, for example, Stacy has worked wonders developing a large international network of friends for the cello music collection through her daily posts of unique materials and information. Uh, I am one of these friends, and that's a good thing because otherwise uh, I might check, uh, check, check, book, check Facebook only every month or so. But the point is that for this large body of patrons, which no doubt includes future donors, Facebook is a preferred mode of communication. Uh, among the patrons uh, with whom we have worked over the years, communication preferences have varied. For Bernard Greenhouse, who was 93 and nearly blind uh, during my year of correspondence with him, it was the fax machine or nothing. He loved getting my 20 page fax letters bearing five to 10 words per page and written with a black Sharpie. I would never have realized to do this because it wasn't something he talked about, but I wouldn't have known it if I hadn't spent face-to-face -face time with him in Wellfleet, his home on Cape Cod, and observed how excited he got when he heard the old fax machine kick in. As I mentioned earlier, when we're dealing with musicians as donors who are usually giving towards the end of their lives, we are interacting with an aging population. In fact, across the board with special collections, the advanced age and health of the donor is changing how we communicate. This is a concern not only for communication with individuals, but as a matter of professional ethics. We want to make certain donors understand what we are saying and have the ability to make intelligent choices about their needing their materials. Some of the donor health issues I've had to work with include loss of hearing, memory loss, and terminally ill donors who have are taking potentially mind-altering medication. When beginning conversations with such donors, the first thing you need to do is assess if the donor really can make clear decisions. If they cannot, the communication you have with them about donating falls into a danger zone ethically, which is not good for the donor and not good for your organization. 
the best method of dealing with these health situations is making certain that the donor has a friend or family member with them whenever you speak to them and that you have another person from the library present to witness the interaction with you. I would never accept a donation if I thought there was a potential for the donor to not understand what was at stake without someone present as a witness. Working with Mac with the cello music collection means that there, is always, there are always two of us if this becomes an issue. It is also important to document each meeting, writing up follow-up emails or letters, which are shared with everyone at the meeting as well as department heads, creating a paper trail that can be referred to if questions arise about particular meetings. Going into a meeting blind is not a good idea at the best of times, let alone a potential donor meeting. For this reason, we conduct a good amount of background research on our donors before we meet them. We are looking not only for talking points about their career, but sometimes we want to see if there is a topic it's safer to avoid. Musicians are performers at heart, and in my experience, they love speaking about their career, especially towards the end of their lives, when they aren't on center stage frequently. As an introvert who is not particularly fluent in small talk, unlike Matt, having some prepared safe topics to bring up is really helpful. It is equally helpful to know what topics not to bring up. There may be painful relationships or scandals or rivalries you want to avoid while you're building your initial relationship. Mac and I discuss these matters before we meet with donors. We also look for institutional connections. While most of the musicians we engage with are not tied to our school or region, we frequently find connections within our collections. We may have music they composed or arranged. We may have material related to a colleague or a teacher of theirs. Having the makings of an even tenuous relationship established helps break the ice and can make the donor feel more comfortable with the idea of our archive being the home for their collection. To be fair, I know in certain cases, donors have done research on us and have prepared questions and tests. So if this all seems a bit manipulative, I can attest from personal experience that it is a two-way street and the donor has the right of way. The donor always has the advantage because the donation is their choice. The donor interaction can be as formulaic as your standard television sitcom in which we all know the plot and the donor has some, something the libraries want, the librarians want, with the conflict being that the librarians have to prove themselves to the donor or the donor chooses someone else. We know the characters and plot, we just aren't certain which of the two endings will take place. I can recall only one donor over the years, and this was long before I came to UNCG, uh, who expressed absolutely no remorse in parting with his library. Asked why he was giving up his books, the scholar Morse Peckham answered abruptly, because I'm sick of the damn things. This contrasts sharply with what Stacy and I usually experience. Our cellists who are, about, uh, who are able to remain active after they donate wish to have copies sent to them, scans will usually suffice. Other times they simply wish to talk to us. A donor remorse is perhaps even more common with family members who donate on the behalf of a relation who has passed. Such donors frequently worry about their lack of expertise in everything from the music uh, itself to the particulars of the negotiation process with us and any sort of follow-up that might be expected of them. Quote, we just want to make sure we're doing the right thing, end quote, is a statement we often hear. There are two obvious givens in assisting the remorseful donor. First, listen, and second, offer reassurance. But the key is to provide anecdotal evidence of what is being done with the donated materials. Stacy does terrific work in this regard. Even before a collection has been cataloged, she regularly use, uses materials from it in the classroom, includes them in presentations, and features them in exhibits. She approaches this systematically, keeping good records 
and communicating regularly with me. There is nothing more helpful than providing donors with concrete evidence that their legacies or those of their distinguished family members will continue to be valued and used for generations. A donor knows what they can do for us. So it's important that we are able to communicate what we can do for the donor if they choose to donate their collection to us. Performance artists to a degree understand that the unique feature of their art cannot be captured. You can never really recreate the moment of a live performance. So they're very concerned about their collection, collection, which is unique in being able to physically represent their career and talent and how it's going to be preserved, promoted, and used. They want to know that their collection will not be sitting in boxes forever collecting dust. As such, I try to communicate exactly how performers and other researchers use the collection, how after a fashion, the donor is still able to take on students and teach after their death. <clears throat> I share with them how I promote the collections and how past students frequently come to visit and how the material is applied to our instructional sessions. Donors are surprisingly interested in knowing the details of how we make their collections accessible. So not only do I talk about finding aids and how they are constructed and one can search online for them, but they want to know the details of cataloging and how that makes material accessible worldwide. Ah, uh, there's a uh, Marilyn Horn. You can uh, she will keep you in awe while I talk about cataloging. Um, from the inception of the cello music uh, collection, the university libraries have been committed to. Uh, the item level cataloging of its music scores, manuscripts, and monographs. Since a high percentage of these items bear annotations and manuscript editions in the hands of the donor, uh, and you see on the screen a fine example uh, regarding Marilyn Horn from a George Darden's collection, uh, our catalogers have routinely made detailed local notes a high priority in bibliographic description. Stacy and I have presented often on how effectively such practice serves access in, uh, to the cello music collection in the digital age. But we've always brought our approach to cataloging into the conversation with prospective donors with reference to what library patrons see when they search our catalog, we answer questions that matter to them. This is how we sell our services. They want to know that their materials will be treated with special attention. As the cataloger at their service, I demonstrate as concretely as possible, uh, I, or I, I, I demonstrate this as concretely as possible. Um, George Darden was fascinated by cataloging. Not every donor is. Uh, so I gave him a set of bibliographic examples, not in the form of mark records, uh, from the cello music collection. He then queried me on how I would approach a pianist's library. Now, he could not have given me an easier test. A born documenter, Darden annotated his scores in a matter not only very detailed, but also specific to the artists with whom he worked. He had already shown me multiple examples that would one day find their way into my local notes in the catalog records from a gentle note to himself when performing Carlisle Floyd's Susanna with Renee Flaming, uh, sorry, Fleming. Um, the, and I quote George's uh, line, since it's not on the screen, it simply says, Renee, take time. Another, and this one you do see on the screen, his score from his score of Rossini's Barber of Seville. Uh, what he has notated there is Marilyn Horn's surprise announcement at a performance, her last performance of this piece at the Met. It's her announcement, her way of telling the audience that they were about to enjoy her in the role of Rosina one last time. She actually changed the recitative le leading into the aria to let the audience know, and that's how they, they found out. Um, 
I made it clear to Darden in our conversations how my description of his materials would deliver such information to researchers. For her part, Stacy was able to speak to the efficacy of local notes in the catalog record in her work with researchers who visit and use the collections, as well as students from middle and high school, music campers to graduate level researchers about how materials, his materials will be used in instruction. So every donor has to sign a deed of gift. And if we want digitized material, we have a separate form for digital licensing. Because these forms have to align with our university accounting, they are not the easiest forms to navigate. Particularly copyright reproduction and tax write-offs are complex issues, so it is necessary during the donation process to spend time explaining what each form means and the options available to the donor. It almost feels anticlimactic that after putting on a show and winning over a donor, the ritual ends with the signing of these documents. Some of the longest conversations and emails I've written to donors were on the topics of the deed of gift and copyright. For this reason, I frequently send the document to the donor before they actually commit to the donation because I like them to be prepared rather than feel blindsided towards the end. And they can have all their questions answered before we are conduct concluding discussions. And of course, the signing of the deed of gift and taking over ownership is not the end of the relationship. You have to remember that a collection is the cumulative legacy of a person's life and the ephemeral nature of the performing arts means the collection represents a lasting physical memorial to a musician's life and career. This means that the donation process is an emotional one and a few tears and a bit of hugging is not uncommon during the process. You wanna make certain after the formal donation that you are keeping the donor updated to let them know their donation is that being valued. Some donors like an occasional update or a holiday card but some will very much want to be invested in the process and want to talk frequently. These are all strategies you can use to communicate with your donor and support them as they progress through the stages of letting go, which can be a difficult topic. So now we'd like to take you to a, um, an interactive process with one of our, our former donors. Okay, and, okay, and uh, now for this case study on the pianist and conductor George Darden, who donated his music library to UNCG in late 2013, following an eventful and most colorful six month period of negotiation with Stacy and me. After distinguishing himself at the Texas Opera Theater and at the Houston Grand Opera, George began his association with the Metropolitan Opera in 1985, serving early on as assistant conductor and prepar preparation pianist in works by Mozart, Rossini, and Verdi. Over the years, he distinguished himself in these capacities, collaborating with a host of the Met's greatest artists and winning critical acclaim in particular for his role in productions of Porgy and Bess, he directed musical preparation of the Gershwin's masterpiece at the Met and beyond in over 160 performances over the course of his international career. And when Nicholas Harnoncourt made known his intention of recording Porgy and Bess with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe, the Met's conductor, James Levine, is reported to have said uh, to Harnon Court, something like, quote, you'll need George, I'll send him over, end quote. The score, Darden's score of Porgy and Bess, now in our collection, um, includes annotations, changes, and cuts for all Darden's productions beginning in 1976 and including Harnon Court's celebrated version. Over the years, George was the preparation for pianists, such a, uh, for such luminaries. He was the preparation pianist 
for such luminaries as the baritone Sir Thomas Allen, uh, seen here on the left. Uh, and I think there he's Baron Mirkozeta in Lehar's Merry Widow, but uh, I'm, I might be corrected on that. I'm sure that on his right is Renee Fleming in Carlisle Floyd's Susanna. As well, he uh, uh, served Marilyn Horn, Placido Domingo, Kiri de Canoa, and uh, Luciano Pavarotti, among others. Uh, by the time he retired from the Met in 2006, George listed among his credits the musical preparation of five operas televised on the PBS Emmy award-winning series, The Metropolitan Presents, and sound recordings on several labels, including RCA. In 2000, uh, George was awarded South Carolina's Order of the Palmetto, that state's highest civilian award for lifetime service to the state and nation. Dating from 2008, I had missed several opportunities to meet George in Asheville, North Carolina, where he frequently visited mutual friends following his retirement to the nearby town of Bat Cave. And you see on the screen uh, uh, pictures that were taken in his studio there in Bat Cave. Then in April 2013, the Asheville bookseller Chandler Gordon, with whom I had worked, uh, years earlier, called to tell me that George was suffering from the later stages of pulmonary fibrosis, a fatal condition. Chan also said that George wished to discuss the possibility of donating his personal library and archival materials to the university libraries at UNCG. I responded with enthusiasm, assuring Chan that I would discuss this with Stacy and assuming, quite wrongly as it turned out, that the first meeting with George would include both Stacy and me. Quote, absolutely not. The pianist thundered when Chan suggested Stacy's inclusion in our proposed meeting. Quote, I'll meet with Nelson or no one from UNCG, end quote, he insisted. Now, Chan had warned me that George's illness was exacerbating his temperamentality. And this outburst, while troubling, provided Stacy and me an invaluable cautionary lesson as we planned for what would prove to be a long, contingency-laden working relationship with the pianist. Agreeing to his terms, we devised an approach to my meeting with him, which would also include Chan Gordon. Um, our goal was to facilitate the process by which Stacy, in a hoped for future meeting, would be able properly to assess and accept a donation from George. Our priorities were first to, to demonstrate to him the visibility he could ensure his collection by entrusting it to the custodial uh, care of the university of the university libraries a claim I would substantiate in the meeting by examples of our success in promoting the cello music collection. And second, to steer the discussion at every turn, as far as possible, at every turn, back to the kind of access and visibility we routinely provide our performance and arts collections, avoiding, if possible, discussion of monetary and tax issues in this first meeting. We didn't want that to set the tone for our relationship. Clearly, George's preference for face-to-face -face communication, which was a trick, that's the landscape on top of the mountain, the remote area where um, George retired. Uh, but his preference was for face-to-face -face, uh, communication. Uh, and when Chan and I arrived at his studio on April 19th, 2013, it quickly became clear that I was in for an afternoon of charming, animated conversation, punctuated with George's rather wicked and prompt to tests of my knowledge and character. For example, at one point, he spoke at length of the piano music of Chopin, 
and while pondering aloud what might be the greatest of this composer's work, he turned to me and asked, quote, well, Mac, what would, what would you say, end quote. I'd done my homework, or I had cheated, as George would later claim, but I knew the answer I needed to give and responded, quote, why? Uh, the mazurkas, of course, end quote. So I got that one right. I passed that test. However, I was not so fortunate in my answer to George's request for my opinion, opinion of Luciano Pavarotti's voice. The enthusiasm I expressed for the celebrated tenor's singing prompted a loud harumph from George, who delivered a stern admonishment and awarded me one demerit. I flunked a second test as well, but more on that in just a moment. So after more than four hours with George, as Chan and I prepared to depart, the pianist declared his readiness to sign the deed of gift I had brought him. And he did so with a sense of urgency, expressing his wish to have his music library uh, delivered to the university within one month and assuring us that we could work out all details by email and telephone communication. The promise of such dispatch seemed to Chan and me too good to be true. And as soon became apparent, it was too good to be true. On the final topic of that initial meeting, Stacy's future role in negotiations, which I brought up, uh, George, agreed to allow this only after chiding me for making such a request. And I quote, why would you bring a woman here? Women don't know anything, he spat. Why would, um, let's see. Yeah, okay, his second line. Well, bring her only if she's over 30, maybe she will know something, end quote. He left open the possibility that he might yet deny Stacy entrance to his studio. So when Matt came to me and told me he had this wonderful donor on the line, I was excited, but I was also very concerned because of the donor's health. George had a terminal illness and he was on some heavy medication. George was struggling with breathing and seemed to have an awful temper, which at times led him to struggle with breathing. He could basically die at any moment given his health condition and with his final statement about Mac bringing me to the next meeting, my imagination was wondering if my mere presence would aggravate him into incapacitation. That being said, according to what Mac was saying, George was exceptionally shrewd and set up what could be considered little traps and tests for Mac when Mac met with him with Chandler. It sounded like George was in a proper state of mind to make his own choice, choices, but by no means did I want any of us going in alone to negotiate, especially since there was the slight degree of misplaced hostility he had with Matt, which Matt will talk about in the next slide. I also felt more comfortable if George had someone there with him during negotiations because his health was so fragile. George complicated this team approach Mac and I have as his perspective of who we were had the potential to limit having another person attending the meeting. The, the misplaced hostility Stacy just mentioned came to light rather dramatically during one of the tests George set me in my initial meeting with him. On that occasion, after an hour or so of discussing nothing but music, he began asking me about myself, and he also started telling me something of his life story. We quickly discovered that we had in common deep roots in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. On the screen, you see my old family home in that city, which dates from the mid 18th century. I had just begun describing this place to George, who had asked about it and who had shown interest in it. Um, and as I started this discussion, his mood visibly altered. And he said in a curt conversation ending tone, quote, 
my Charleston home was the Jenkins Orphanage, end quote. As Stacy and I later realized, this episode set one part of George at odds with me because in his estimation, it placed me among the Charleston aristocracy for whom he felt utter contempt. George had long searched for evidence of his birth history, and he had been told that all relevant records were long lost. He did not believe this for a minute, and he was deeply frustrated by what he felt sure was an elitist cover-up of his roots. Uh, he said to Stacy and to me that he had no doubt that he was the illegitimate child of a blue-blood Charlestonian who had systematically destroyed all evidence of the unpleasantness of his existence. This story is but one example of several Stacy and I might relate concerning George's complex and complicating tendency to work us into his personal backstory. So once Mac and I planned on meeting George together, I began some black background research. <clears throat> There were several immediate connections, one of them being that we had material relating to his teacher, uh, to two of his teachers. Our music library at UNCG, of course, is the Harold Schiffman Music Library, through the composer, uh, and this was one of George's teachers, as well as we had material relating to Julia Adams in one of our collections. She was a composer and pianist in Montreal. Um, North Carolina, and she was George's or one of George's early piano teachers in Western North Carolina. I printed out a copy of one of her pieces to give to George, so I would have something to hand off. We did not know about Natasha Mogg until we mentioned the cellists in our collection during the meeting, and George made a very positive association with that. I also knew that George wanted to prove that we were competent enough, wanted us to prove that we were competent enough to handle his collection, but that his collection was unique in our archive. George had been speaking to other archives and was angry that one of the archives who held his closest teacher's material did not know who she was when questioned. I knew that George may test my nut collection knowledge, which I'm accustomed to, but I still prepared to give biographic information about the musicians in our collections if needed. Mac and I take donor, donor meetings very seriously because we usually don't have many in-person meetings with donors, so we have to make the most of the time we have. As you can guess from Mac's description, we were not anticipating an easy conversation with George, so we talked about a few plans and contingencies. A major issue was that we were not 100% certain George would acknowledge my presence or even let me in the building. I did consider that I might have to stay out in the van, and to be fair, it was a pleasant day on the side of the mountain where George's house was, but I did make a point of not drinking very much liquid just to be safe. If I was allowed in, <clears throat> Mac would do all the talking. As the archivist in charge of the collection, I still have to be the one to say no if there were unrealistic conditions demanded about the collection. So we were going in with something of a good cop, bad cop approach with me being the bad cop if necessary. We also agreed not to bring up any new topics because it was impossible to predict what would upset and anger George. We wanted to play it safe. We also decided to conduct an oral history to not only document George's career, but to let him know that he was what he was saying mattered and that he was the star of the show. So when we made it up the mountain on that narrow gravel road to George's house, I optimistically got out of the van to introduce myself. George was at his studio door and was scowling at us, but as he was looking at me, his expression changed completely. He asked me if I was Jewish, which was a bit unnerving because I have no idea what's coming next with a question like that. I was wearing this pendant you see on the slide, which is called a mezuzah. It has a scroll with a prayer in Hebrew in it, and it is a common piece of Jewish jewelry. I told him politely, but guardedly, yes, I am Jewish. I was happy he was at least not acknowledging my presence. As it turned out, George, though not Jewish, had enjoyed very positive working relationships with Jewish musicians throughout his life, especially during his time with the Tel Aviv Opera, and he felt an immediate geniality towards me as a result of the religion I shared with his professional friends. 
In a flash, I became the person George wanted to interact with for our meeting, which was unexpected, but Mac and I were happy about the positive turn of events. As I was introducing myself to George, he asked me about my family last name because it sounded Eastern European. And I told him that Krim was a name given to us when we immigrated to the United States because we were from the Crimea region and we did not know our original family name. George, George seemed to feel an immediate connection to me as he was an orphan who searched many years to find the name of his birth family only to be told that those records had been destroyed. When we went into a studio and I set up the audio equipment to record George, it seemed I could do no wrong because we shared so many things in common. Mac still handled the talking as we had our plan, though. George was still playing a little dominant game with Mac. If Mac did pronounce a composer's name, uh, if he didn't pronounce it up to George's standard, George would correct him. Um, he would order Mac to fetch things for him as we spoke. Some of the conflict over Mac and George's contrary childhood settled a bit, but George clearly wanted to demonstrate that he was the boss of the situation, and Mac held up under pressure with his usual charm. After we spent several hours talking about his life, he wanted to know more about how the archive would handle his material. George wanted to make certain his material would be secure and preserved, and how he wanted to know how we would make it accessible. I spoke about that with him, and he was specifically interested in our instruction and how our collections would be used to educate young people. That was a huge selling point for him. I also spoke about the kinds of music research that had been conducted in the archive. George seemed genuinely pleased with all of the details I was providing, but one change he demanded was with our new gifts. There was one statement George found troubling during his initial meeting with Max, so I talked to my department head and we agreed to remove the clause from George's deed of gift. As I was allowed in to see his collection, I was comfortable being able to make that change. Highlighted here on the screen, you can see what George referred to as, quote, the offending deaccession clause, end quote, which delayed his donation and for which he held me personally responsible over the course of the summer of 2013, just because I was the first one who presented him with the document back in April. Of course, I had no hand in uh, writing this very standard deed of gift, uh, but I mounted no self-defense on this ground because I had learned that this was not the sort of fight you picked with George. Best to apologize, strike the offending clause as uh, Stacy did, and appreciate this man's good graces, which he had made us work so hard to discover. So I honestly don't remember how many hours we spent with George that day. It may have been five or six hours, but I do know that by the end, George was happy enough to play a few notes on his piano and give us a group hug. We filled up the van with the help of George's friend, Roger, who was visiting during the meeting and headed back to Greensboro. I would share many phone conversations and emails with George after this. Through the final few months up until his death in April of 2014. Although George certainly had a volatile personality, he was also loving and incredibly generous. Mac and I both understood that part of the tension arose from George's deep concern about what would come of his legacy. And I like to think he would be pleased with us and how true to his wishes and true to his wishes, students are learning through his collection. So I'm certain he would find some aspects to critique, especially with Matt. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Thank you both. Uh, we will give you a virtual round of applause. Um, there were some comments in the uh, chat, mostly about some of the more controversial statements made, um, but uh, you're getting lots of love right now. That was great, great presentation, awesome. Um, 
yeah, does anybody have any questions for Stacy or Mac? I like the storytelling element of it. That's nice. We don't get a, we don't get a lot of that at um, instruction conferences. <laughs> so maybe I should rethink my approach. Bye, Sarah. Thanks for attending. What does cheese sprinkles mean? I have no idea. Uh, I, I have not met a musician that actually knows what that means either. It's one of my favorite bits of annotation. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions besides that critical question. Unfortunately, we're not able to answer. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Um, <laughs> nice, Suzanne. Uh, I'm gonna go stop the recording um, and say one last uh, thank you.